planning to vote November 4th. Are you sure you're still registered? A new study raises serious questions about a little known process that could get you purged from the voting rolls. Welcome to Meet the Bloggers. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and Katie's quite right. There are a lot of issues with this election and elections coming around the corner. Are you sure you're registered? Well, we're going to find out today some of the, those issues and whether you've been purged because tens of thousands of people in dozens of states have been purged. The person to talk to us about election protection today is our guest, James Rucker. He's been with MoveOn.org before, and now he's with uh, ColorOfChange.org. And for a long time, he's been working as a community organizer, and that is not a dirty word. James Rucker, welcome to Meet the Bloggers. So, James, I'm glad you're here today. We've got to figure out what are all the different kinds of election problems. Let's start there. Let's start broadly. Sure. Well, there, there, there are those that happen on Election Day and those that happened before. One of the things that we're most concerned with is in low-income communities and communities of color, uh, you have things like misinformation campaigns, folks being – flyers being in neighborhoods saying that, you know, if, if you live in this area, voting is going to take place – on a different day, one of the most notorious things that happens, and it's happened most recently in Philadelphia, are people being told that if they have outstanding parking tickets, if they're behind on their rent, uh, they haven't paid their utility bill, those kinds of things, when they show up to the polling place, they could be arrested. Um, so you, you have things like that. You have the idea that you're going to have to wait in, lo in line for a long time. Even the idea uh, that you know, you're, like, you're in a place with broken down equipment, um, with just you know, a lack of infrastructure, that, that becomes a deterrent to voting. Um, and, of course, then there are the problems, people being told they need to vote provisionally when they shouldn't be. Uh, there's, of course, also purging in Cajun. And right. I think people get it mixed up every once in a while, so I want it to be absolutely clear. What's purging and what's Cajun? Right. So, so purging is what is done by the state. Typically what you're trying to do is, you know, folks who are actually deceased, um, folks who've moved away and they haven't voted in several cycles, you know they, they, they basically don't need to be on the rolls. Um, in some states you have laws where if, if someone has committed a felony, and, uh, then they, they can't vote at some period of time. So states go through a process, a normal process, like anyone with a mailing list would do, to clean up that list. Um, now, that can be problematic. You, you don't do that uh, very close to an election. It doesn't give people a, a chance to learn that they're not on the rolls and then correct it. And we've seen secretaries of state basically use purging as a way to get legitimate voters basically off the rolls as well. Caging is very different, and caging is, is done by the parties. The way it works is you send a piece of mail. Um, maybe it's return receipt required, um, and there's usually a do not forward on, on that piece of mail. So you send mail to people, they t and this is where the big problem is. They target. They go to areas where they believe they're Democratic voters. They target those areas with these mailings. Whatever comes back in terms of a piece of mail that didn't get forwarded, if there's no return receipt, they say, okay, there's no voter there. So on election day when someone goes to vote, it'll be a surprise to them. There's someone there saying, hey, I don't believe you live at the address that you, said, uh, that you say you do. I'm challenging your ability to vote. So what happened with the Michigan foreclosure list is what I want to talk about next. And would that be purging or caging in that case? Right. So that's that's caging. Um, and effectively, it's caging without going through the direct mail process the way I, I just explained. But the idea there is to use lists. And again, they're looking for anything that's that's published, right? Anything that's available uh, because we have a government with some free information to, to, to deny folks the right to vote. So here we've got lists of folks whose homes are likely to be foreclosed on. Right. Um, that becomes a matter of public record. They could still be living in the house. They could have caught up on payments. They could be down the street with a friend. Um, the, the, the idea, though, is to use someone's appearance on a foreclosure list as a way to effectively cage them, to say, you're, you're in this box of folks who probably don't live at this address. And as you can imagine, it's, it's on the one hand a problem that you're, you actually may be denied your, your ability to vote. But imagine being in line <clears throat> and, and watching this process that someone's going through or knowing uh, you know, I have financial problems. It's an embarrassing thing. It's an embarrassing thing for the person who's who's being challenged. It slows down the process for everyone, creating long lines. And again, this is happening in a very targeted fashion. So, you know, the the result is you have voters who can't vote. You have other voters um, who it's taking a longer time for them to vote. And you have this kind of unease that that basically occurs throughout the polling place. 
it, it's kind of almost like reverse PR. They, they want to send out the message there that, hey, if you're going to come to vote, man, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> and if you've got right. financial problems, you don't want to show up. If you got any parking right. tickets, we might arrest. I mean, like all these different things to discourage voting because right. the more people that vote, apparently, uh, the worse the Republicans do, which in a democratic system doesn't bode well for them overall in the long term, I would imagine. Uh, and right. one of their problems is that we got this uh, organization, ACORN, registering 1.3 million poor people, all of them <laughs> voting. So my question to you, James, is ACORN right. socialist or communist? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I don't want to get that wrong, so I won't, I won't answer. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'll say this. ACORN has played this critical role in voter registration in communities of color, low-income communities, for a very long time. And you know, John McCain, and I, and I, I want to go make sure I, I, I find out the event, John McCain keynoted an ACORN event. You know, these are folks who've been around, who do very good work. It's a very difficult process to do the kind of registration they're doing at these levels. And what's happened is it's, it's very straightforward, and I'm, I'm kind of uh, struck with disbelief how this, this basic lie has been going around about ACORN. What you have are voter registrations that are not valid. And ACORN has to turn those in because you, you can imagine one of the things you don't want to do is, you know, decide as someone collecting registrations, eh, this doesn't, you know, meet my standard here. Eh, I guess I just don't want those folks to vote. So the idea is ACORN has to turn in all these registrations. But now think about it. If you have, you know, James Rucker uh, basically on 50 different registration forms. How does that make any impact come election day? Am I, is James Rucker going to show up 50 times and vote? No, it doesn't work like that. It's never worked like that. It's a myth that what's happening is voter fraud. Um, but it's very effective, of course, in scaring uh, folks who support ACORN. Um, and it also really is targeting low-income communities at the same time. Um, you know, this is somewhat of a separate issue, but related. You know, th at the same time, they're talking about ACORN having pushed on banks um, and having kind of uh, essentially given rise to the financial crisis by pushing for subprime loans, which, which is also not true. So anyway, it, it's a very great way to malign ACORN. It's completely untrue. James, I want to be in the place where 50 James Ruckers show up. <laughs> I think that's going to be a badass place, man. <laughs> that's where I want to become elected. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, so James, here's the uh, By the way, just for so everybody knows, uh, the event that uh, John McCain keynoted for ACORN, it wasn't like in 1983 or it's McCain, it could have been 1893. Uh, it was just a little while ago. It was in 2006. He comes out there and he's like, ACORN wow. rocks. Oh, wait, they're helping poor people vote? No, now they're terrible. So th right. there's a lot of hypocrisy going on here and a lot of nonsense going on before the election. So how do we fight the nonsense, James? I know at Color of Change you guys are working on a couple of different projects. Uh, let's start with secretaries yeah. of state. What, what's the relevance there and what are you working on? Yeah, it's huge. And there's a project actually, it's not uh, directly connected to color of change. It's called secretary of state project. And I'm a part of that. Most people don't know who the secretary of state is. So they think they kind of push papers around and, you know, make sure certain things about the state run properly. But the, the secretary of state is basically the most senior election official um, in each of the states in the country. Uh, they set policy that the counties follow, and as you see in Ohio um, and in Florida in 2000, 2004, the Secretary of State also was the Bush-Cheney uh, co-chair, and they basically have this clear interest in having the election go one way. And so when it comes down to interpreting rules at the last minute, when it comes down to when purges are going to happen, how they're going to happen, uh, that, that role becomes extremely important. And so the Secretary of State project is in part about educating the public, but then also getting good nonpartisan secretaries of state who have it as their biggest value to make sure everyone can vote. Um, that's one effort, and it's a really important effort. Um, and, of course, secretaries of state are being elected all the time. Um, there are also a few other projects. We're running an election administration project where we allow our members, we've got about 1,400 who signed up, to interview uh, county election officials across the country basically quizzing them on their readiness and understanding where there may be problems. And if possible, we don't have a lot of time, but where there may be problems, rallying help, where people seem to be up to no good, drawing attention to it. Uh, Advancement Project is a group that basically created a wonderful model, and we're trying to follow that. They are going into 21 jurisdictions 
where they know pretty much there may be some issues. And a lot of that is around allocation. You have a county where you'll have some precincts where people wait five minutes or no minutes. You'll have others where people are waiting for three hours. Uh, so their goal is to highlight those problems and get, get fixes in place before Election Day. Let's talk about that for a quick second because I love that project because every election it seems like we go, oh, my God, turns out they only put w uh, one ballot box in or voting booth in, a, uh, in the poorer areas, but in the richer areas they got like 28. So that makes a difference in lines on how long people wait, and it discourages more right. voters. And I always think, why doesn't somebody do something about that? So is this project yeah. working ahead of time to make sure that that's worked out so that the lines in the poorer and the richer areas, et cetera, are all about the same? Yeah, no, that's exactly the goal of Advancement Project. And this election, you know, they've, they've focused on 21 jurisdictions. Like I said, with our project, we're working at the county level, and it's a little harder but, um, you know, we're trying to do that same kind of thing, shine a light on those areas. I do believe, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not late in the game by any means, but it's, there's not a lot of time this cycle. But there's no reason, you know, we don't, you don't have long lines at Safeway, uh, depending on where you are in the country. You know, different stores do it right, others don't. You can figure out how to optimize the, the placement of equipment and workers so that everyone has an easy voting experience. You just have to have it be a priority. And that's, again, we, you bring up the Secretary of State. You, you, you've got to have someone in office who sees it as a priority that everyone has easy access to the vote. And, and, and we're just not there yet. Not everyone does. All right. James Rucker of Color of Change, thank you so much for joining us on Meet the Bloggers. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys, we're going to take a little break here. When we come back, Jonathan Kim is going to review a documentary for us on election protection. It's called Murder, Spies, and Voting Lies. Kind of rhymes. I like it. Come right back with that. My name is Henry Rollins. I think it is very important for you to have a political opinion because it will affect where you go, who you hang out with, how long you could live, and what is going to be your future. So if any of that concerns you, you should avail yourself to the many outlets that give you facts and opinions by which you can base your opinions. Do something. Hi, I'm Kate Shepard, and you saw me on Meet the Bloggers. I'm the political reporter for Grist.org. I write their muckraker column. I wish that people were as hyped up about energy policy as they are about the new Facebook. And if you want to know more about these issues, check out Grist.org. I'll say elections were stolen. In fact, you I think will? I did. You think the election was stolen? Absolutely. In 2004? Look mm -hmm. at the exit polls, and they don't match the results. The same thing that we complained about when the Ukraine had their election right. and actually made them have a new one. Right their exit polls were actually closer right. than ours. In fact, in the states that had electronic voting, the numbers didn't match at all with the exit polling. But in states where they had paper, what do you know? The exit polls and the final results were almost perfect. The documentary Murders, Spies, and Voting Lies, The Clint Curtis Story, is truly one of the scariest movies I've seen in a very long time. That's because the evidence of widespread, systemic voter fraud it exposes is so well documented, explosive, and most of all plausible, it'll definitely keep you up at night. This gripping true story plays much like a film noir, where the first victim appears to be American democracy, and Clint Curtis, a Florida computer programmer turned whistleblower, finds himself at the center of what could very well be one of the biggest crimes in American history, the stealing of the 2004 election. Journalist and blogger Brad Friedman of uh, bradblog.com is our guide through the movie as he interviews Curtis and others. Clint Curtis was working for a Florida tech company in 2000 when he was asked to write a program that would allow someone to easily hack electronic voting machines. Who asked him to do it? A man named Tom Feeney, a Florida state legislator, lobbyist, former running mate of Jeb Bush, and currently a Republican congressman. In true noir fashion, the mystery widens, deepens, and, and becomes considerably more dangerous as Curtis's dog is shot, his life is threatened, and a private citizen who takes up the case commits suicide under mysterious circumstances before he can break the story. Throw in the fact that convicted super lobbyist Jack Abramoff and convicted Congressman Bob Ney lobbied against requiring voting machines to provide paper verification, and you have the making of an extremely sordid tale of electoral crime. But, as I said, the biggest crime being committed is the one against American voters. In a country where you can't buy a pack of gum without a receipt, it's truly insane that our voting machines don't provide some sort of paper verification. As someone in the film says, 
slot machines are given way, way more scrutiny than voting machines. And, so, and as someone else once said, it doesn't matter who votes, but who counts those votes. So my advice, when you go to vote, bring your video camera and look out for dirty tricks. This is Jonathan Kim for Meet the Vloggers. Welcome back to Meet the Bloggers. It's time to uh, do what we say in the title, which is Meet the Bloggers. And for the first time, we have in-studio guest Brad Friedman. Uh, no one knows more about election uh, issues than Brad does, and I say that with all seriousness. Jonathan Kim was just mentioning him, of course. Uh, of, he's the Brad of Brad Blog fame in connection to the movie Murder, Spies, and Voting Lies. And uh, Brad's going to stick around, actually, after the show and participate in the live blog with us where uh, he's going to answer your questions. So stick around for that. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, brother. Good to be here. All right. And also joining us is John Pincus. Uh, John uh, blogs at Liminal States, and he has helped supervise the Voter Suppression Wiki, which is very interesting. John, uh, welcome to Meet the Bloggers. Thanks a lot. Good to be here. All right. For John, first question, most obvious one. Uh, what is a Voter Suppression Wiki? Well, it's really designed to be a hub of information and action for people wanting to do something about the... Uh, the, all the efforts to suppress votes in the 2008 U.S. elections for people to find out more and then to figure out how they can act to protect their own votes and, and others as well. And so uh, people have their stories in there of, hey, if this is going wrong, they're reporting it in the wiki and then others can see it uh, in the wiki and respond to it and perhaps bring it to the media's attention. Is that generally how it works? That, that's exactly it, to be the hub of a communication channel, to get these reports surfaced and then also very important when updated information comes out, things like changes in polling places, uh, things like reports of problems, to get the word out to the community so people can actually respond to it. So, Brad, a lot of people might not know the difference between election fraud and voter fraud. What's that difference? Well, most people don't know. The Republicans have been doing their best to confuse the two issues. One, voter fraud, incredibly rare, uh, happens almost never. When it does, it's generally via absentee ballot fraud. And yet the Republicans have put all of this money, huge effort, into suggesting there's massive Democratic voter fraud at the polls in, so that they can issue photo ID restrictions, knowing that anywhere from 20 to 30 million Americans, largely Democratic Americans, uh, don't have the type of photo ID that they would need to vote. They would be disenfranchised. So they've created this uh, solution in search of a problem, frankly, in order to disenfranchise Americans. That's voter fraud. On the other hand, election fraud is a very serious problem. Uh, we, we've seen now tens of thousands of voters have been purged from the rolls illegally across the country, uh, the, the gaming of the, the voting systems, uh, the, you know, the elect electronic voting machines themselves. Uh, that's administrative election fraud. That's a very serious concern. And uh, the purging of these voters alone is going to be, I'm, I'm calling it right, I'm predicting right now the November surprise. We're going to see a meltdown when folks go to the polls, find out they're not registered at all. So, John, we might have an issue of election fraud going on right now, actually, in Philadelphia at Drexel. What happened there? It's classic deceptive campaign practices. Somebody posted flyers around campus and then around the neighborhood warning people that if they, uh, if they voted and they have outstanding traffic tickets or arrest warrants, they'll be arrested on the spot. It, total nonsense. Stuff like this happens every election. The Drexel Democrats found this, got it up on their website quickly, alerted the media. Since then, it's gotten out to exactly what needs to happen. Mainstream media attention telling people, this is a rumor, don't fall for it. And really good example of people, once again, targeting college students. It, they do. It's a classic dirty trick. The problem is we're, we're seeing it at an increasing rate. And, you know, there's also this national effort. It's become a national effort. It's no longer, you know, sort of localized. So we've seen, for example, student voters. Uh, have been intimidated by registrars who have put out notices in, in uh, Richmond County, Virginia, El Paso County, Colorado, all swing states, coincidentally, you know, saying that if, uh, if students try to vote here, college students try to vote here, uh, they'll lose their scholarship. They'll have to be declared, they can't be declared as dependents on their parents' tax forms anymore. This has happened all over the country. It's always inaccurate. And when these election officials are caught, they say, oh, it was an accident. We, d we didn't mean to say that. We got it wrong. And yet you see the same language all over the country from these officials, which kind of tells you there's, there's you know, an, a national uh, effort here to dissuade people from voting, largely college students, minorities, the elderly. 
Uh, back in 1980, Paul Weyrich, the conservative founding father who still consults with these guys today, uh, said in Dallas to a convention of 15,000 people uh, that he doesn't want everyone to vote, that their leverage in election goes up as the voting populace goes down. He said, you can, want, you can look at it on YouTube, it's there. He was caught saying it. That is the Rosetta Stone for the modern Republican Party of how they, what they must do to win elections, which is keep people from voting. And we have to make sure that doesn't happen, that voters get to vote. Again, there's a pattern of similar kinds of things targeting these various groups all over the country. One of the real values of something like the Voter Suppression Wiki is it surfaces these patterns so that everybody can see, huh, college students are getting targeted a lot of places. Minorities are getting targeted a lot of places. How do we as communities react, get the word out about what our rights are, not to believe these rumors, to go to the polls, to vote, to know what to do in case you run into a situation where, you're, where your registration has been purged or caged. Call the hotline. That kind of information lets people counter these, this, these attempted suppressions. John, stay right there because we're going to come back and talk about what we can do on election day if you run into any problems. We'll be right back on Meet the Bloggers. Don't believe the hype. This election is about real issues. I'm voting to end the wage gap because I don't think I should make 78 cents for every dollar the men in my office make. I'm voting for a college education that I can afford. I'm voting for an end to the war in Iraq so that my friends can come home. I'm voting for clean energy policies so that the air my little brother breathes doesn't make him sick. I'm voting for a better future so I don't have to work two jobs just to pay my rent. I am voting for new leadership because the America I believe in is better than this. Tell the media and the candidates what issues you're voting for this November. Upload your video testimonials at www.imvotingfor.org. Welcome back, everybody. Now, uh, November 4th is D-Day, Brad. Uh, if something goes wrong on that day, what can you do? Okay, D-Day is today, actually. We need to get to work right now, and there are things that you can do right now, because by the time we get to Election Day, frankly, it's too late in many ways. So uh, John is right that, you know, he, he points up this is a participatory democracy. We've got to get to work. One of the things you can do, uh, call on your candidates, whoever they may be, any party, national, local, uh, state, uh, to go to standingforvoters.org. Get them on record right now to take the pledge they're not going to concede an election until every vote is counted, counted accurately, and all uh, election questions are adequately resolved. Get them on record, standingforvoters.org. Tell them, hey, we'll stand up for you if you stand up for us. I don't want to see what happened with John Kerry last time, you know, when he uh, conceded the next day. Uh, check right now to make sure you are registered, even if you voted in the primary. You can go to VotersUnite.org, uh, click uh, Am I Registered. In all 50 states, you can find out, are you actually registered? Take action, proactive action, right now. Uh, bring a video camera on Election Day when you ask about the problems on Election Day. Bring your video camera, your cell phone. Uh, upload this stuff to videothevote.org and to the Wiki uh, Election Suppression Wiki. Uh, get the word out. Make noise. Don't be cowed. You know, be, be peaceful, be confident, but don't let people tell you you can't vote. And then you can hang around. You, well, also, you can be a poll worker, by the way. They need them like crazy. The bad guys have their people in the polls. Let's get the good guys in there. Be a poll worker. Be a poll watcher. Uh, you know, bring a cha folding chairs and water because the lines are going to go crazy. Uh, and participate in that vote. At the end of the day, you can follow those ballots. If you're lucky enough to have paper ballots, you can follow them all the way to the county and watch them being counted. It's hard to see when they're optically scanned inside a computer, but the more eyeballs out there, the harder it is for the bad guys to get away with it. And this time, 
we ain't going to let them, but that's up to the people to, to make sure that happens. That's right. And John, there's a couple other good suggestions in, in the wiki, uh, including the Twitter report. What is the Twitter report? Yeah, the, the Twitter vote report fits in well with what Brad's saying about keep a lot of eyes out there. Basically asking people who vote to Twitter back whether or not you know they've run into any problems voting. That will, on election day, give us a map of where are the problems flaring up. Uh, they're going to be tying it in with various visualization software, so it'll be easy for anybody to see in real time where are we having the problems. Uh, another good uh, election day uh, program, Pat Brad's totally right about volunteer workers for democracy is a good place to do that. There's also uh, the, uh, the immediate response network, a bunch of people who, you know, if, need, if there need to be some kind of get the word out alerts, they are standing by to receive text messages so they can help get the words out in their community. Bunch of lists of uh, grassroots election protection organizations on the, on the wiki, um, and constantly constantly adding to them because there's it really is the people standing up and saying, you know, this time we want to vote. We want our votes to be counted, and we're going to do something about it. All right. Well, those are all excellent suggestions. That's all the time we have left for today. But remember, everybody, uh, Brad Freeman is going to stick around and answer your questions in the live blog. So you look forward to that. John, thank you. Brad, thank you uh, for doing it. And next week, we got a, a really interesting issue, race in the campaign. Uh, Tim Wise, author of White Like Me and other books, will uh, join us. I, I read some of Tim's work. We've talked about it on The Young Turks. He's terrific. I can't wait to talk to him next week. That's, of course, at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific on Fridays, as always. And then until then, as Brad and John just told you, do something.